Brothers and sisters, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So we talked quite a bit about water this morning. Water to wash your hands as you come into the building or after handling money or before Holy Communion in light of this coronavirus pandemic threat. I'm guessing you're ready, though, to hear about something other than threats this morning. So as they say on TV, in other news, your children are safe, tucked in their beds, when a voice comes inside the darkened bedroom, may I have a glass of water? You're on a trip to grandma's house or some other distant place just a few minutes outside of home, and a voice comes from the back seat. We're thirsty. Speaking of thirsty... We have almost 15, or up to 15, confirmation students here on a Wednesday after school, and they come in hungry and thirsty. A table of four can take two pitchers of water or more. They're thirsty. I myself had my own water jar in the fridge growing up where I would fill it up and drink during the day. We didn't have those water bottles you carry around. I had my, my water jar. Our children are thirsty, not simply for water, for something to drink, but for living water to fill their soul. How do we help them discover that water, whether they're in church or out of church, whether they, they sit in the front pew, the back pew, or the front pew, whether they are by the lakeside with plenty of water around, whether they're at the dining room table with mom and dad and grandparents and brothers and sisters. They thirst, and not merely for something to drink, but for meaning and purpose and life. For understanding. One of the things that seems to have surprised the Samaritan woman who came to the well, besides the fact that Jesus asked her for a drink of water and had nothing to carry it in, other than the fact that he was a man talking to her, a woman, and a Jew talking to a Samaritan, which you just didn't do in those days. Other than that, what surprised her was that he told her everything that she had ever done. He knew her without ever having met her before. He understood her even though he, she did not know him. Sometimes the ones who can do that best for our children are grandparents. Hmm? Gerhard Frost, theologian, poet, grandfather, in a book entitled Bless My Growing, wrote a poem entitled An Early Cry. Only two, and true to us all, she loved a story. Her name, Rachel, 
But when she said it, it came out as retchu. On this particular evening, nothing was right. Bumps, bruises, frustrations, and disappointments had drawn her to me, and she stood with her curly head bent into my lap, hiding two tear-stained cheeks. It was then that I said, Shall Granddaddy tell you a story about two horses who could run fast? Without a moment's lift of the head, no Tory horses, came the uncapitulating reply. I tried again. Shall I tell you a story about a nice man who had two little puppies? Again, with no less spirit and emphasis, no Tory nice man. Then, not anticipating her response or realizing the wisdom I had at that moment, I said, shall I tell you a story about Rachel? Now, for the first time, the little head moved and two eyes looked up. Tori Retchu? The bait was just too good and the little mourner was caught in the net of excitement and self-interest. I've wondered since, may it not be that we've told too many stories about horses that can run fast and nice men with puppies and have often forgotten to put the Rachels and Richards, the Tommies and Trudies in the middle of the situation. The cry for relevance is an early cry. Not only can grandparents show that understanding that children so need, but parents as well. As a parent, I probably have told too few stories about Ratchu, or in my case, about Angela, and Adam, and Nicholas, and Zachary. In fact, lately my kids have been asking me to tell them stories about themselves. What was I like growing up, they asked just the other day. What were we like? Because they want to know stories of each other as well. And they want to know stories about me, about us as parents. So when we went out, Holly and I and our family, to celebrate our 25th anniversary, we heard that question. Are there stories we haven't heard about the two of you? Helping our children understand themselves and understand themselves as being understood by parents and other adults around them, and of course by God, is helping them discover the living water of Jesus. Another way to help them discover living water is, of course, helping them discover the Bible, which we talked about last week, but also to see us as adults in the Bible, reading the Bible, and praying, and talking about our faith. Now, I know it can be embarrassing for kids and maybe adults alike. I remember being somewhat embarrassed by the extent to which my mother read her Bible, talked about her faith, even how she would talk about praying for me as I went to Europe two different times in college. If we allow them to see us read the Bible and pray and let them hear us talk about our faith, we also, as parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters, need to be prepared for the inevitable question, why? Why do you read? Why do you pray? Why do you talk the way you do about your faith? I suspect my mother had something to do with my reaction when, at around 30, 31 years old, I found myself in the middle of the desert in New Mexico, 
without a job, 1,500 miles away from home, and reading the book of Numbers, which, like the book of Exodus, from which we also read this morning, has the Israelites complaining to Moses, their leader, who had led them through the water of the Red Sea without incident, saying, did you bring us out into the wilderness to die because we don't have a drink of water? And as much as that question related to me in the desert, I knew that I could not feel sorry for myself because I knew God was with me in the same way God had been with my mother through her various trials in her life. So there's two ways. Helping our children know that God understands them, to feel that we understand them or want to understand them. Secondly, to see us and hear us engaged in faith. Another way we can help them discover living water is by engaging them in worship. So I know it's tempting when we have little ones especially to sit in the back of the church so that we don't inconvenience others with their noises and their comings and their goings. But I would encourage you who have small children to try bringing them to the front now and again. Let them see what's going on, to be involved in what's going on. Help them to pay attention to the changes that go on from season to season, the colors of the pyramids, the movements of the people, the words in the hymnal or on the screen. What do they mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? Even before they take Holy Communion, what do those elements, those bread and the wine, mean? And when there's a baptism in church, Tell them about, about their baptism, about the living water that flowed over them and into them through the Holy Spirit and flows out of them in gestures of love. Living water that invigorates us through all the ages of our lives. Living water that binds us together, allows us to travel with one another through the Red Seas, the dangers and the joys of life. The water that Jesus brings is not merely for our outsides. It doesn't simply tickle our tummies as it flows into us, into it from a glass or a bottle. It is living water, spiritual water, that rises up and shouts of joy and flows out that not only we, but others can live abundantly as Jesus desires us to live amid all the puzzling things that befall children and adults in this world of ours. Amen.